study of philosophy is as much hindered by the conceit that will not argue as it is by the argumentative approach. This conceit relies on truths which are taken for granted and which it sees no need to re-examine. It just lays them down and believes it is entitled to assert them as well as to judge and pass sentence by appealing to them. In view of this, it is especially necessary that philosophizing should again be made a serious business. In the case of all other sciences, arts, skills, and crafts, everyone is convinced that a complex and laborious program of learning and practice is necessary for competence. Yet, when it comes to philosophy, there seems to be a currently prevailing prejudice to the effect that, although not everyone who has eyes and fingers and is given leather and last is at once in a position to make shoes, everyone nevertheless immediately understands how to philosophize and how to evaluate philosophy, since he possesses the criterion for doing so in his natural reason, as if he did not likewise possess the measure for a shoe in his own foot. It seems that philosophical competence cons consists precisely in an absence of information and study as though philosophy left off where they began. Philosophy is frequently taken to be a purely formal kind of knowledge, void of content, and the insight is sadly lacking that whatever truth there may be in the content of any discipline or science, it can only deserve the name if such truth has been engendered by philosophy. Let the other sciences try to argue as much as they like without philosophy, Without it, they can have in them neither life, spirit, nor truth. Section 67 is this great passage that ends with this, this statement that let the other sciences try to argue as much as they like without philosophy. Without it, they can have in them neither life, spirit, nor truth. Um, that's a bold statement on Hegel's part, and you might say, what does that got to do with all the things that I've sketched up here? Well, you know, when the other sciences, the other disciplines, the other fields of, of knowledge are asserting themselves, but they're doing so in a way against philosophy or um, just sort of dismissing it, taking it for granted, um, not being adequately philosophical themselves, they, they end up limiting their, their themselves without actually realizing it, and they are going to lapse either into this side or into this side, whether we grasp it or not. So it's not like we have four terms here, you know, the argumentative, raisonnieren approach, the sort of commonsensical, don't bother me with your reasoning, I've got facts on my side sort of approach, philosophical science, and then other sciences. What he's saying is, if other sciences are not adequately philosophical, they don't stay here, they wind up on this side and they wind up on this side. Probably a weird hybrid mixture of both. So let's look at these, these two approaches. We've got the <clears throat> argumentative approach and we've got the conceit that will not argue. And we've looked a lot at the argumentative approach already. We don't need to say an awful lot more about it. It's overly critical. It's taking advantage of the fact that, that subjectivity is, in fact, negativity, the fact that the world is not, you know, completely finished product, the fact that we can look at things from multiple perspectives to tear things down to say, that's not any good. And it, it ends up in a, a, what he calls, you know, a vanity or futility, a skeptical standpoint that we're going to see come up over and over again that is, it's not satisfying. It, it doesn't satisfy what the, the reasoning human being actually needs. And, you know, what's, what's the opposite of skepticism? A kind of dogmatism. And oftentimes people want that sort of thing precisely because they feel the pain of, you know, being caught in this void where things don't seem to matter. So they latch on to something. And every culture has some of these positions to offer at least some of its members. Uh, our culture has, has a wide array of things that you could, you know, sort of ready-made step into and be part of. You know, you want to be an unthinking Christian? That's quite possible. You want to be an unthinking atheist? That's quite possible. They're both as equally, you know, um, backward, stupid, um, undialectical as, as each other. You want to, you know, have the sort of vantage point of being the Christian critic, you want to be the, the atheist critic, you want to play around with criticism but not actually apply it to yourself and see the, that, you know, your standpoint might need some dialectical retooling. 
knock yourself out. You, there's websites devoted to that sort of thing. You want to be a stoic and read Epictetus and walk around with the end Caridian in your back pocket and, you know, pop out quotes every once in a while. You can do that in a sort of, you know, block-headed, um, here's, here's my dogma kind of way. Or you can also do that in a, I'm going to criticize everything from the standpoint of stoicism kind of way. Or you could actually, you know, um, read Epictetus, you probably have to read more than just the Enchiridion, you have to read the discourses too, that the Enchiridion is a uh, best hits of. Um, but you'd have to actually like think through these things. And Hegel's saying philosophy, real philosophy, is going to occupy a kind of, not an Aristotelian mean place, but something in between these two. Let's look now over here at this Einbildung, this conceit, as Miller is translating it, that will not argue. It says, the study of philosophy is as much hindered by the conceit that will not argue as it is by the argumentative approach that gets things wrong and, and thinks that because it can argue against things and raise objections that that put an end to you know, the development of the dialectic. This conceit relies on truths which are taken for granted and which it sees no reason to re-examine. It just lays them down and believes it itself entitled to assert them as well to judge and pass sentence by appealing to them. How often do we see people um, raising objections because they are a fan of Bertrand Russell or Anne Rand, and Bertrand Russell said this, or Anne Rand said this, or, you know, pick newer people. Richard Dawkins said this, or... Um, you know, I should probably pick out a few theists as well. Um, you can read Augustine in, in a kind of a block-headed, uh, I'm going to take everything for granted sort of way. Uh, although, you know, if you really read Augustine, that's not going to be the case. But you're going to say, Augustine said this. Or you can be one of those, those Thomists who's what I call a, a fundamentalist of the Summa. Look, it says that here on this page, Thomas put an end to that, that question. Or, you know, you don't even have to go to philosophy to do that. Neuroscientists have told me this because I saw this thing on the Gawker. Or, you know, we know all about who's a racist, who's a sexist, who's a classist, who's a thisist, who's a thatist, uh, because I saw this ish, this, this, you know, this blog post in Jezebel. That's basically just consumer culture of the mind there. That's what Hegel's actually talking about. It could be just, you know, relying on textbooks, it can be, you know, just reading the, the newest thing that pops up. The, the whole point here is that somebody has a few thoughts and they don't bother to re-examine them. They're not doing anything dialectical with them because they're not saying, well, are these really sufficient? Can these actually say something about themselves? Do they, do they self-other? You know, what don't they include? Can they extend to what it is that they don't include? Can they address rival points of view? The person here doesn't feel the need to do that because they already, they already know it. They've already got it figured out. Maybe if they don't have the whole universe figured out, they've got their town figured out, they've got their house figured out, they've got their laboratory figured out, they've got the church figured out. They don't need to be bothered with anything else. So he says, in view of this, it's especially necessary that philosophy should again be made a serious business. Too many people, in Hegel's time, in his view, are puttering around with philosophy. There's too many dilettantes involved in the game, and that's giving things a bad name. By the way, is this a new thing? Well, read the Republic, and you'll see Socrates saying the same thing. Philosophy is being you know, given a bad rap by all these people who are doing a crap job with it, and, you know, somebody ought to come along and do philosophy right. Plato's talking about himself in that case, right? Um, so he says, In the case of all the other sciences, arts, skills, and crafts, everyone is convinced that a complex and laborious program of learning and practice is necessary for competence. You see where this is going, don't you? Why isn't that the case for philosophy? Ask yourself, too. Is it different in our time? than it is in the time that Hegel's complaining about? How many people throw the word philosophy around uh, and have no clue what it means? Or just the dimmest idea? Or they've read one book and they've really read it well. You know, they've read Bertrand Russell's History of Philosophy and now they know about the whole history and they know where everybody fits in and they never bother to question whether Russell was a biased source. Or even worse, if they read the Durant's uh, you know, History of Philosophy. You want to source that's not particularly uh, good, that, that's one. Why is it 
that there's apprenticeship programs in all these skills and you wouldn't hire somebody to do work for you who doesn't know what they're doing, who doesn't have a certificate, who hasn't earned the right to call themselves a journeyman. But you're perfectly fine with anybody whatsoever calling themselves a philosopher or, you know, all people out there who have no idea what philosophy is talking about this person's a philosopher, that person's a philosopher. I mean, why get upset about, um, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson or Stephen Hawking um, denigrating philosophy unless you actually have put in the time to know what philosophy could mean? Going beyond, say, just an intro class, um, unless you had a really good intro teacher and a really good intro text and you really applied yourself. See, these are important questions, and they're, they're perennial questions. When it comes to other things, we think that there's a body of knowledge out there that you have to acquire. Not only do you have to learn information, you have to undergo a formation of yourself. That information has to become a part of you. Not that you become a walking encyclopedia, but that you're able to apply that knowledge. You're able to figure out what applies at what time, what's relevant, what's not relevant. You're able to see how things fit together. Why would it be any different for philosophy if philosophy actually means something? Now, if philosophy is just as Mel Brooks, you know, conveyed, as I've heard so many times when I tell people that I'm a philosopher, being a bullshit artist, then uh, presumably there's no actual skill. But it's interesting, because other people who are essentially bullshit artists, meaning artists who work with, you know, various types of bullshit, um, sales, for example, there's a thing called salesmanship. You can actually teach somebody how to sell things better, how to, you know, read the customer, what to say, what not to say. There's a body of knowledge. Comedy, very difficult thing to do. It's not so easy to be funny. They're, good comics put a lot of thought into it. They study each other. The same thing has to go for philosophy. You cannot be a philosopher just going off and pretending to be Descartes and meditate you know, on things by yourself or with your you know, little friends uh, circle over there who went to that particular institution and read those five articles and you know, trade them back and forth you can't really do philosophy well without seeing what other people in the field are doing, without trying to make their achievements your own and trying to assimilate that and then try to move past them. So he says, what's the problem here? You know, a lot of people will, for example, when it comes to shoemaking, that's not something we can relate to so easy, but shoemaking, they, they think that um, it's not enough just to give somebody leather and some tools and say, all right, make me some shoes. You actually have to know what you're doing. Um, let's think about in terms of culinary arts. That's probably something that we can relate to a little bit more in our culture, which is foodie obsessed and has, you know, a whole bunch of cooking shows and things like that. You can actually watch a famous chef put together one of these great recipes and follow along and say, oh, that's a cool ingredient, and then watch the judges eat them, and oh, I taste the saffron in that. You know, you can do that. That doesn't make you a chef. You walk into the kitchen and start, you know, getting your ingredients out and start working with them, you'll figure out real quick whether um, watching cooking shows is actually going to convey expertise to you. Buying cookbooks, that's not enough either. It probably helps to take a cooking class. Or, you know, like in, in my case, it probably helps to have had a formation when you were a child, having a, a mother who was essentially a gourmet cook um, you know, who would spend hours on, on meals and we would sit there as kids and watch her or sometimes we'd apprentice by she'd say, all right, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do this. I, I know how to break down a chicken because I saw my mother do it. Time after time after time. I know what a chicken heart tastes like because those are the little delicacies that she kept for us when she was turning a chicken into three meals. Uh, and she'd give them to, to myself and my, my sister. That's what philosophy is like as well. The problem is, is that everybody assumes that because they've got natural reason or common sense or, you know, some critical thinking capacities over here, that they're up to doing philosophy in a serious way. That doesn't mean that they can't, you know, 
write a philosophy paper, they can't read Plato, they can't read Hegel, but they have to acknowledge the fact that they're beginners or journeymen or intermediates. They're not at the level of the masters quite yet. Perhaps they're not even equipped to make judgments about the masters. So he says, um, everyone nevertheless immediately understands how to philosophize, how to evaluate philosophy, since he possesses the criterion for doing so in his natural reason. You might as well say, Hegel says, and this is a great response, that, well, you possess the, uh, the criterion for shoemaking because you've got a foot. Or you possess the criterion for culinary arts because you've got a mouth and a tongue and taste buds and that sort of thing. Or, hey, you're, you're a musician because you've got some ears. No, it, it's not quite so simple as that. Um, it's a laborious process. So he says... It seems to these people as if philosophical competence consists precisely in an absence of information and study, as if philosophy left off where they began. And, you know, some philosophers have actually been quite detrimental in, in saying things like, well, philosophy is just thinking without making any presuppositions, or it's like non-dogmatic, or it's different from the other disciplines in that it has no content. Hegel would say, that's nonsense. You guys are actually giving a false image of philosophy to people. You're doing a disservice to, to them and to yourself and to philosophy as a result. So he says, um, the insight is sadly lacking that where, where, whatever truth there may be in the content of any discipline or science, it can only deserve the name of such truth has been engendered by philosophy. Now, does that mean that, you know, unless a philosopher came up with an important biological principle um, it's not really any good. No, but probably that biologist who came up with that was doing philosophy and not calling it philosophy at the time. We go back to Protagoras, you know, in, in Plato's dialogue, where Protagoras said that many people are sophists. They just are doing, you know, things undercover, uh, so to speak. Plato would be willing to say that, um, to a certain extent, those who are actually thinking about the grounds of their discipline thinking the big thoughts, thinking the ones that really matter, are doing philosophy. They're doing philosophy of this, they're doing philosophy of that, and it gets reincorporated into the discipline, but it, it is doing philosophy. If you're thinking about, you know, whether you've actually got stuff right in, in how you're applying things in your discipline, you're, you're probably doing epistemology, you're doing critical thinking. If you're making arguments about your discipline, you're doing rhetoric or you're doing logic or dialectic. If you're thinking about what is the nature of the thing that I'm actually working with, how should I comprehend it? You're probably doing metaphysics. If you're thinking about, you know, what are the important implications for how human beings relate to each other um, and what this means about human beings, you're doing philosophical anthropology. And we could go on down the list for aesthetics, for ethics, for political philosophy, for philosophy of language, um, a whole bunch of different... Uh, fields all rolled into philosophy that permeate the other fields. This is Hegel's standpoint on that. Um, when this gets lost sight of, the disciplines go this way or they go this way. When philosophy itself loses sight of the need to be rigorous, the need to be a serious business, it winds up over here or winds up over here and doesn't do anybody any good. In place of the long process of culture towards genuine philosophy, a movement as rich as it is profound, through which spirit achieves knowledge, we are offered as quite equivalent either direct revelation from heaven or the sound common sense that has never labored over or informed itself regarding other knowledge or genuine philosophy. And we're assured that these are quite as good substitutes as some claim chicory is for coffee. It is not a pleasant experience to see ignorance and a crudity without form or taste which cannot focus its thought on a single abstract proposition, still less on a connected chain of them, claiming at one moment to be freedom of thought and toleration, and at the next to be even genius. Genius, we all know, was once all the rage in poetry as it now is in philosophy. But when its productions made sense at all, such genius begat only trite prose instead of poetry, or getting beyond that, only crazy rhetoric. 
So nowadays, philosophizing by the light of nature, which regards itself as too good for the notion, and as being an intuitive and poetic thinking in virtue of this deficiency, brings to market the arbitrary combinations of an imagination that has only been disorganized by its thoughts, an imagery that is neither fish nor flesh, neither poetry nor philosophy. Section 68 is going to bring back up some old enemies, some old objects of criticism that Hegel has already several times addressed in the course of this, this preface. Um, and at this point you might actually be saying, yeah, come on Hegel, that's enough. But we're getting close to the end of the preface, so bear with him for a moment. There's a really important point that's being made here. He's not actually using the term that we use nowadays, which we might call um, presentism. And when we're talking about that, what we mean is judging everything from the standpoint of the present. It, it's often used by historians who want to say that, you know, if we want to understand ancient Greece, we can't just take our categories of understanding and just sort of like paste them back onto ancient Greece. For example, um, a lot of times people want to say, well, you know, ancient Greece as an entire culture, as a civilization, as if there, there was such a thing, um, you know, that, that you could generalize about in such ways, was uh, much more open to and accepting of homosexuality than the last, say, 200, 300 years of Western culture had been until fairly recently. And their evidence for that will be, you know, looking at things like, you know, Plato's Symposium and, and the jokes that are being made there, discussions about male-male homosexual relations, Sappho's poetry, all sorts of things like that. And what's important to keep in mind is that the Greeks didn't understand the difference between homosexual and heterosexual in quite the way that we did. For them, and also for the Romans, you know, and again, we're really generalizing, really painting things with a broad brush here. It doesn't apply in every case. But they tended to see it less in terms of, is there a you know, same-sex attraction or, or intercourse or something like that? And they much more tended to see the, you know, pejorative aspect of it as being, being penetrated. So it's fine to be the penetrator, not so good to be the penetratee. And so, you know, if you actually want analogies to this, we'd have to talk about something much more like, you know, the, the down-low culture where people say, well, I'm not really homosexual because I'm, I'm the one who is penetrating, uh, where there's some opprobrium attached to that, right? Um, Presentism would read back all that sort of stuff. Or they would say, for example, well, you know, the ancient Greeks, if we want to you know, make them out to be bad guys, look at that jerk Aristotle saying that women are defective men, you know, or that some people naturally deserve to be slaves. Well, we know from the present perspective that that's not the case, so what a dummy he was. What a dummy all those Greeks were to have slavery. The problem with this is that it's assuming that our present vantage point is the one that sort of counts for consciousness throughout all of history. And it doesn't see history in a Hegelian fashion as a set of advances of consciousness. Which, by the way, I should include this too. Um, Oftentimes include options where you could be going up to the next phase, but you could also be declining. You could also be falling back to previous phases. History, for Hegel, is a hard-won set of achievements that we should not write off, we should not treat as, you know, sort of consumer commodity culture for the intellectual life or for, um, you know, uh, upworthy articles or things like that. We should, we should actually have a certain kind of reverence towards the brutal labor that was required to, to dig ourselves out from our, our, you know, our previous ways of seeing the world, our previous understandings of the human condition. Here's a great example. Hegel says that, you know, the human, uh, the human species as a whole had to develop from an understanding of power relations in terms of tyranny, moving to aristocracy, and then finally moving to something like democracy 
And that politically that happened early, but in terms of the, the spiritual life that didn't happen, in terms of truth that didn't happen right away. So, you know, under a tyranny, one man is free, or one person is free. Uh, under an aristocracy, some people are free vis-a-vis -vis each other. Under a democracy, all are free, at least politically. And he talks about this in terms of uh, the development of religion and how long it took to realize that everybody can have a, an unmediated relation to God or everybody can be the one who's in the right vantage point. Not just the priest, not just the, you know, we go further back, not just the arbitrary person who's, who happened to have been born into the family that carries out the sacrifices. Each one of these things, each one of these shapes of consciousness for Hegel is, like I said, a hard-won achievement that we have to think through. What do people want to do instead from the vantage point of the present as they're doing philosophy? Well, he says, in place of the long process of culture towards genuine philosophy, a movement is rich as it is profound, a movement that's very rich at each one of these points. Each one of these points was a world full of subjects that we can go back to and make sense of and appreciate. The vantage point of the present offers it is quite equivalent one of two things. Direct revelations from heaven, God speaks through me, or not God, world spirit speaks through me. Now, if anybody says world spirit speaks through me in a way that doesn't take all this into account, they're not a Hegelian. Um, science speaks through me. Um, the, the enlightened masters speak through me. Pick whatever you like. The human heart. I have compassion. I have sympathy. I'm a unique individual because I was doing that before it was cool. Any of these sort of appeals to like direct intuition are rather, here's the problem with them, they're rather arbitrary. They're always carried out from the perspective of the present. They try to give us the meaning of the present. And the reason why I've put these, these arrows here is what they do is they talk about the present, what the current gestalt is, but they don't actually advance us anywhere. They don't continue us on the process, and they don't provide us with a retrospective look back. Because if, if we're going to move from E, it's going to be by taking all of this and then moving forward, Hegel would say. So direct revelations from heaven, or sound common sense. And sound common sense is always the common sense of this present moment, this present culture, this group of people. Common sense is not as common, as universal as it makes itself out to be. Um, so he says, these are, these are presented as, as quite good substitutes. You might add to that, you know. Um, relying on textbooks or spark notes or Wikipedia or, you know, not reading Hegel and just watching these videos would fall into the same thing, I would say. Um, you should be reading the Hegel. You should be thinking about the Hegel. Um, he says, these, we're assured that these are quite good substitutes, as some claim chicory is for coffee. Um, chicory is not as good as coffee. Uh, it's an ersatz. It's a substitute, right? And, you know, when, when you're being given a substitute, once you've actually had the real thing, you, you can't be quite content with it. It says, It's not a pleasant experience to see ignorance and a crudity without form and taste which cannot focus its thought on a single abstract proposition, still less on a connected chain of them, which is what's required here. Claiming at one moment to be freedom of thought and toleration, and the next to be even genius. And, you know, we see this in our own time, as Hegel saw it in his. Um, you're always going to have people who are really know-nothings and yet claim to be the spirit of the time or claim that they're the ones who are going to articulate the new shape of freedom, the new shape of meaning. Um, you know, they usually often have great slogans, great logos, but it's all, you know, superficial flash and there's no substance there. Now he talks about genius. This is really interesting. He says, genius, we all know, was once all the rage in poetry as it now is in philosophy. In, in Hegel's time, so what is genius? The idea behind genius is that you've got a person who is unique and they're somehow hyper-qualified, hyper-competent. They can't explain to you how it is that they're able to do what they do. They just do it. They're, you know, just 
super extraordinary and they're using their their you know ingenium their their gifts that are from within and just deploying them so why are some people great musicians it's not because they practice more it's not because they've studied the history of music and assimilated it they're just geniuses if they have studied the history of music Mozart looked at the, the previous musicians and saw stuff in them that we couldn't possibly fathom. Well, does that work for philosophy? Hegel says no. He says, um, look at how it turned out in poetry. People were saying, oh yeah, this person's a genius, this person's a genius, this person's a genius. And what did it beget? Trite prose instead of poetry. Or getting beyond that, crazy rhetoric. Garbage. Genius is not a substitute for making things that really matter and last. So nowadays, philosophizing by the light of nature, which regards itself as too good for the notion, and as being an intuitive and poetic thinking, again, we see the appeal to intuition, in virtue of this deficiency, brings to market the arbitrary combinations of an imagination that has only been disorganized by its thoughts, an imagery that is neither fish nor flesh, neither poetry nor philosophy. What he's saying is that geniuses are, it's not that they're not welcome in philosophy, it's just that they're not going to do any useful work. They, they are, in effect, dead ends. They're not going to take the process further. And, and the trouble is, is that they're going to pretend to be, and a lot of other people are going to look at them and puff them up as the wave of the future. It's work. It's the patience, the labor of the negative, the, you know, the hard work that's required to enter into the phenomena themselves, to subject oneself to them, especially when those phenomena are the past history of human consciousness. You know, adapting yourself to another person's consciousness, that takes an awful lot of work. Coming up with BS that you pull just out of the air or out of your feelings or out of, you know, mishmashing thoughts or randomizing things or just trying to, you know, one-up everybody, that's not very hard. But it doesn't lead you anywhere. This, studying this, assimilating yourself to that, following through on it, lets you have the possibility of moving beyond. You know, Hegel would be perfectly willing to say, I'm not a genius, I actually am uh, not even a dwarf on the shoulders of giants, I am just consciousness on the shoulder of giants, and I'm able to bring these things together, uh, in part because I've assimilated all this, this past stuff and thought about it, and if it weren't for them, I couldn't be where I am. It's not that I've got this thing within, you know, inside of me that's, you know, a special talent for systematization or anything like that. And it's not like, you know, sound common sense is suggesting this, this uh, procedure to me. Uh, I'm actually pretty alone while I'm, while I'm putting this together in 1807. Um, rather, it's that I have followed out the past developments, the dialectical developments of these shapes of consciousness, and now I see where we can go from here.